Obviously, our honored and distinguished guest today needs no introduction. He's a very decorated Marine, uh, number one selling New York Times author, one of the greatest. Uh, uh, Colonel was telling me backstage that uh, no school has bought more of his books, no university has bought more of his books than Liberty University, and I think that's an affirmation that he's at home today. And so we're going on to have him. Uh, I, I can tell you uh, on and on about just um, the heroic ways that this man has served our nation, the champion that he continues to be for Liberty, the champion that he continues to be for our men and women in the armed forces, the voice that he continues to be for them. But more than anything else, what I love is that he is a true American. He is the father of four. He is the husband of one. And I uh, <laughs> wanted to clarify that. And he's the grandfather, the grandfather of 13. 14 now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? 14 and two thirds. And so, can we just honor our distinguished guest today, the great Colonel North, the grandfather of 14 and two-thirds. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, it is great to be back. I've got a timer out here, and Marines try to start on time and try to finish on time, so I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to make sure that you don't miss any classes. Gee, thanks. <laughs> it is a privilege to be here. Fox News gave me the option of being here with you or being in Erbil, Iraq, and I am really glad to be in Lynchburg at Liberty. I can't tell you how much. I, as some of you know, there was an election yesterday. I hope you all voted if you're a Republican. <laughs> There goes the 501c3 status right there, boom, gone. I am humbled by the uh, opportunity to receive the George Rogers Champion of Freedom Award. George, uh, for those of you who don't know him, I've had the great honor in, of meeting him several times. Uh, he is a real American hero. Uh, he was a survivor of the Bataan Death March. Uh, when he was leading the old-time Gospel Hour, he frequently reminded people that the reason he survived and came out of that camp at 85 pounds, having gone in as a soldier in the United States Army, taller than I am, 6'2", and healthy, he came out at 85 pounds and he says he survived because his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wanted him to. That's a hero. I met him here first at Liberty University in 1988 at a graduation ceremony. At the time, he was the CEO of Old Time Gospel Hour, and he went on to, to lead. He's now 92, and he, he did so for, so remarkably over those years, and what a great inspiration to every soldier, sailor, airman, guardsman, and Marine. I am unworthy to stand in George Rogers' shoes or his boots, but he and all those of you who have served in our armed forces, those of you who are spouses of those who have served, are the reasons I'm here today. Before I go further, because I am in television, it is time for a commercial thank you for making Fox News number one so that I've got a job. <laughs> the American people made it, made it happen. I've now been with Fox for 14 years. I have also learned that not every American watches Fox News 24-7 like they're supposed to. <laughs> I was stranded in the Indianapolis airport a few weeks back, and the flights were all delayed. There was a fire or something in Chicago, and there's six or seven hour delays. It's the middle of the night. There's a thousand plus unhappy people in the airport. A gentleman walks over to me. I'm wearing a baseball hat and sunglasses at midnight, trying to find a place to charge my cell phone. And there's a lot of really unhappy people there. And this gentleman walks up to me and says, I know who you are. I said, please. He said, no, no, I, I loved, past tense, loved watching you on television. And that book you wrote about World War II, and I've actually done two of them, but that book made me cry on every page. Can I have your autograph, Mr. Brokaw? 
Apparently, I'm not wearing enough makeup. And so I took out, being a smart aleck, Fox News gives us these cards to hand out for autographs so you don't have to tear up napkins. And I took out one of the cards, flipped it over, and said, what's your name, sir? He said, Phil. And I wrote, Phil, all the best, Tom, and handed him the, the card. I'm feeling pretty smug about my smart aleckness at that point. And he looks at the card. Gets a little tear in his eye, and he says, I'm the only happy person in this airport. Now I feel like absolute awful. <laughs> so since I'm with a bunch of youngsters studying everything from physics to theology, I will lay this before you. What is the right thing to do at that point? Should I tell him, hey, I'm really not Tom Brokaw? I'm better looking, whatever. What do you do? I'll answer this later on for you. I'll tell you what my wife told me when I got home. I want, to, I want to speak, if I may, just very quickly about the exceptionalism of America. I first came to this college when it was a college, not a university. You could put the entire student body in one of these aisles, and it's now grown to be one of the greatest universities on the planet Earth. And that's a great tribute to those who had the vision and the leadership to do that. I get to spend time, day in and day out, my only beat for Fox News is soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, Marines, and law enforcement. So I get to keep company with real heroes. In fact, it's been my life. My dad was a hero. My mom and dad met at a USO dance in 1941. The USO, as some of you may not know, was actually founded by the Salvation Army. And they met at what had to be one of the first dances. She was a school teacher. He was a second lieutenant in the United States Army. By the time I was born in 1943 in San Antonio, Texas, he was gone. Some Texans out there, y'all. And, and I grew up surrounded by uncles who'd served in the U.S. Marines in the Pacific Theater of World War II. All of my uncles, all of my, everybody I knew served in either the Vietnam, excuse me, served in either World War II or Korea or both. And all my brothers served in the military, not because we had to, but because we had role models in our lives that just left you with that expectation that that's what you were going to do. Being a role model is the most important thing you can be. When you graduate from this great institution, you're going to take with you the experience of all these faculties, the faculty and the staff, the administration, the vision that made this university great. And you are going to be able to show someone else how to lead. You can't just tell them. You have to show them. The only way to lead is by being up front. And the best way to lead is to set the example. You got to walk the walk. You can't just talk the talk. Fox News gives me the opportunity to tell those kinds of stories to youngsters and let them tell their stories. That's my job. Let them tell the stories without telling the bad guys things they don't need to know. And so in 57 embeds that I've done for Fox News, when our then 14th grandchild was being born, David. Fox producers, my guys that go with me overseas, put together a little clip so that I could explain to my grandchildren where I'd been while they were celebrating birthdays. Here's just a snippet from 57 embeds of what they look like. Now dial the volume down on this thing so we don't blow everybody out, but if you've got that, Bobby, go ahead and spool it up and, and let's see if we these are remarkable young Americans. They are the kinds of folks who come from every walk of life in the country. This footage was shot in the Hindu Kush, in Mesopotamia, in the Philippines. 2.4 million young Americans have now served in this war. And this just shows just a very brief sample of what they do. The adversaries that they face are tenacious, brutal, often suicidal, more akin to what my uncles faced in the Pacific Theater than what my dad saw in the European Theater in World War II. There is no military force in the world 
as competent, capable, or as combat experienced as those serving in our military today. And most importantly, for the very first time since the American Revolution, every single American serving in uniform in this very long war is a volunteer. It never happened in between the Revolution and now. And they are all volunteers, every one of them. They either came or they stayed, and they became the best military force on the planet. Unfortunately, my colleagues, not as much at Fox News, but elsewhere in the media, are vicious oftentimes, and so are politicians. They beat Abu Ghraib like it was a rented mule. The Newsweek magazine created a totally fictitious story about a Quran being flushed down a toilet in Guantanamo. And I was in Iraq when that happened. That story came out, and I watched thousands of people die as a consequence of a story that was completely false. It took three weeks for Newsweek to acknowledge that it was false. We had a United States senator describe those who serve in our armed forces as likened to Stalin, Hitler, and Pol Pot, the butcher of Cambodia. We have a Pulitzer Prize recipient at the New York Times, he also writes for the Washington Compost, who describes those serving in our military as, quote, nothing but poor kids from Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama who couldn't get a decent job or health insurance, so they joined the military because that's all we offered them. I got news for you, Mr. Hedges. You're dead wrong about those who serve in our military. Here's a few frames of what I have learned from them in those 57 embeds overseas. First of all, they came and joined the military because of what you see on the screen right now. As recently as two weeks ago, I was asking, why did you join the military? And the youngsters all said the same thing, even though some of them were in grade school or younger when those towers went down. The average age of a person coming into the military today is 20 and a half years of age. They're all at minimum high school graduates. Most of them have 13 and a half years of education, meaning a year plus of after high school. They're more likely to be married than any military force we've ever seen before. They go to work wearing an eight-pound Kevlar helmet, a 42-pound flak jacket. They put 50 to 75 pounds in their back, and they can use the most sophisticated weapons and equipment ever designed by the hand and mind of man. They can use their weapons like part of their body, or they can use their bodies like weapons, and they can take a life or save one because they're so remarkably well-trained. The youngster who once wouldn't share a candy bar with his little brother will now give away his last drop of water to a wounded comrade. He'll give his only MRE to a hungry Afghan kid and split his ammo with his mates in a firefight because they both need ammo. They become the protectors of Muslim women and children in a part of the world where that's a strange idea. Their responsibility and accountability exceed that of the CEO of any corporation in America. And when you see them gather in a prayer circle like this, they are not getting ready to go out on a football field. I dare the American Civil Liberties Union to tell these government employees, stop praying on government time. I was at Arlington Cemetery yesterday morning for a ceremony to inter one of my friends. And I look at those youngsters. If you go back to that last slide, just pull that one back up just for a moment. This is a little bit of footage taken of a United States Navy corpsman. It's a remarkable young guy. He's six feet four inches tall. The unit I'm with on the 6th of April 2003 has just been ambushed by a Republican Guards regiment. And Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, is the lead element of the Marine attack toward Baghdad, which is the smoke you can see in the background. The corpsman rushed, by the way, not corpsman, corpsman. The corpsman rushes out on the battlefield and starts picking up wounded Marines and bringing them to the helicopter that's now landed in the, on the tarmac. This is the fourth casualty. The first three were Marines. If you look carefully at that slide, that's a frame from the footage on my helmet cam. 
That's not a wounded a Marine he's carrying. That is a wounded Iraqi Republican Guardsman. He's gone on the battlefield, put battle dressings on him, and carries him on his back to the helicopter because it's the right thing to do. Unbeknownst to me, because I can't see it, I'm now looking through both my helmet cam and a mini cam that I've got in my hand. I don't see the Reuters news crew rush up and start tracking what this corpsman is doing. The crew chief starts to yell, that the helicopter's taking fire, we're going to have more casualties, and we've got to take off. So I'm running now behind the corpsman back into the gunfight as he's going back to save more wounded guys. And the Reuters news crew shouts out, and you can hear it loud and clear on the microphone I've got wedged in my flak jacket and the microphone he's got in his. Hey, mate, what did you do that for? Didn't you notice that was an Iraqi? In other words, you stupid American. And the corpsman, because this is polite company and I've got two generals and a chaplain here, I can only put it this way, the corpsman gives a gesture to the Reuters news crew. <laughs> he gives a gesture to the Reuters news crew, and then he shouts, and unfortunately he used several expletives, which I will also leave out, because we'd have used it on air if he hadn't. He shouts back at them, didn't you notice, expletive, expletive, he was wounded? That's what we do. We're Americans. What a great message. The, the level of commitment that has been made in this war is extraordinary. We, we've not seen this at least in my lifetime, maybe my parents did, the greatest generation that Tom Brokaw really did write about. And he described that greatest generation just as what it was, the greatest. Sixteen and a half million men and women in uniform. The population of the country is less than 180 million. It's said, and I believe it to be true, every American over the age of 10 knew the name of someone serving in the military. Gold Star families were legion. And so the commitment being made today by less than a million on active duty, less than 800,000 in the Guard and Reserve is extraordinary. At the funeral service yesterday at Arlington, the chaplain told me they will do 30 interment ceremonies a day as long as the weather holds. What's that tell you? It tells you that that greatest generation is passing away. It tells you that the commitment level made by those in this generation is extraordinary. I brought with me a few frames, runs about 40 seconds, that I shot last summer out in Afghanistan. What you're about to see on the screen is a United States Marine captain by the name of Matt Lampert. Matt Lampert is on his second combat tour we did not put this on Fox News, and you will see why in just a moment. When I say the word commitment, I want you to think in the future about Matt Lampert. My name is uh, Captain Matt Lampert. This is my uh, second combat deployment to uh, Afghanistan. And uh, I just wish uh, American people would understand there's a lot of people here that still believe in what we're doing out here and, uh, and are willing to come back again and again to, uh, to prove that point. Matt Lampert commands a special operations company. Uh, that was shot at Leatherneck Bastion, the biggest base in southern Afghanistan, just a few months ago. This week, that base was closed, and there are no Marine combat units left. There's special operations units. But that's a level of commitment. The producers in New York decided that was simply too graphic to show the American people. I want you to understand what Matt Lampert represents. Matt Lampert represents the best and bravest of this generation. His lovely wife is a Marine helicopter pilot, and Matt Lampert lost both legs in his first combat tour, and he's now back on his second. That's commitment. Some of my colleagues don't know how to measure commitment like that, and so they're critical. I like to remind them that 
If you can't figure out what a hero is, then you probably don't belong in the business of reporting the news. Because you see, a, a hero isn't someone who wears a spandex suit and a cape. It's not someone who catches the pass in the end zone, even when Liberty is beating Notre Dame. It's not the person who climbs a mountain and sets a new record. A hero is a person who puts themselves at risk for the benefit of others. And that includes their families, which are now being targeted by the same terrorist organization that is crucifying Christians in the land that Paul once walked and built churches. And so the commitment necessary today is going to be filled by those who understand that we have treated our veterans right. And so those of you who have already served and come here to get a great education, remind your classmates, remind your fellow students of the nature of commitment. That's not bragging. That's special. I want to just close with a brief clip from the president that I was blessed to serve. This was put together by the folks who run my foundation that provides the track chairs and the homes and the college scholarships for the youngsters who've lost a parent serving in the line of duty. This is remarkable because the president that I was blessed to serve spoke from the heart, not a teleprompter. And so this is what Ronald Reagan thought of America's heroes. So. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses, or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bello Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Porkchop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. 
We are Americans. What a, what a remarkable privilege it was to serve that president as closely as I did. I learned an awful lot about myself and about what America was all about just by listening and watching. My challenge for you here today is if you make commitments, keep them. If you surround yourself with the kind of people that I've been blessed to be around, who will admonish you and encourage you, who will hold you to the standard that's in the good book, then you will be blessed to be, because those with whom you keep company will define who you are. If you associate with those who serve others, whether it's in battlefields or business or at a pulpit, it's a lot easier to look yourself in the mirror in the morning if you understand what your real legacy is supposed to be. You must know where you are going and why you are going there and be unashamed to say so. You must show others, not just tell others, that you believe that. And so when I get asked like I was yesterday at that interment ceremony at Arlington by a widow grieving and their children, what is it I want to be? I want to be remembered by those who love me most, my wife, my four children, their mates, and now our 14 and two-thirds grandchildren, that I was the one who showed them how to fight the fight, how to finish the race, and how to keep the faith. It's not something that I want them to have to learn because I told them. I want to, them to say that I showed them how to do that. And if you don't understand what I mean about knowing where you are going and why you are going there, then I suggest you need to find someone with whom you can keep company who does know that. The faculty here is full of it. My good friend Major Bob Dees knows of that. He writes and teaches about the resilience of a leader. And part of the resilience of being a leader is showing people the right way to do things. I'll leave you with one last thought. Showing people how to do it is a lot easier and better than just telling people. If you, if you think back to how you learned to tie your shoes, it was because someone knelt down in front of you and showed you how to do it. They didn't put a diagram up on, this, on a screen. They didn't do a PowerPoint presentation on it. They knelt down in an act akin to what Jesus did on Holy Thursday. Think about it. He kneels down and he washes his disciples' feet in an apt, act of absolute humility. He's their leader. He washes their feet and tells them to go and do the same for others, that the leaders are going to be the followers, and that that act, very similar to someone who loved you kneeling in front of you and showing you how to tie your shoes, is perhaps the most vivid example we have in our lives today. And oh yeah, I told you I'd tell you what my wife said when I brought that card home. She said, Oliver? You're a jerk. <laughs> that poor man is going to get home, take it out and show his wife, and he's going to say, look, Tom broke off, and then he's going to look at the back of the card and see your name on it. And he's going to wonder why Tom Brokaw is carrying around Ollie North's Fox News cards. D don't make that mistake. Don't, don't be mistaken for something you're not. Don't be confused for something you'd like to be, go forth and do it. God bless you and thank you for having me here. <laughs>